subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello everyone welcome to today's dns session we are going to discuss today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 20th september 2021 we have picked up two articles from today's newspaper and have discussed them as per the demand of the exam but before we begin the discussion there is an important announcement tomorrow the dns revision mcq compilation will be released for indian economy and the history section gradually the mcq compilation will be released for every section so make sure you get hold of these mcq compilations and use them for quick revision for your coming prelims exam this article is from page number 7 of today's newspaper empathy through education the article basically focuses on social and emotional learning Social and emotional learning has been an important highlight of new education policy of 2020. Social and emotional learning basically means that a person has to be aware and has the ability to manage the emotion so that he or she can effectively go through the social situation that he or she faces. Social and emotional learning is said to inculcate collaboration, cooperation, develop effective communication creativity and innovation in people social and emotional learning is considered to be foundational for human development it makes us an intelligent social being where people in society can live like different cells in body of an organism actuating the concept of plato who said that the parts must work for the benefit of whole and whole must benefit the parts for this concept to take effect we have to be a social being that comes from social and emotional learning the article highlights that social and emotional learning includes cultivating two things empathy and theory of mind empathy is very high human value human value is a term mentioned in the syllabus of gs paper 4 right in the beginning look sympathy means to understand other people's emotion but empathy is way ahead of sympathy empathy implies that person not only understand other people's emotion but they also might feel those emotions from their perspective for example if you are walking down the street and you see a beggar you understand that the person is facing hardship out of that understanding you help the beggar that is sympathy but if you also understand the way he or she feels the loss of dignity that the person is facing the emotional financial physical stress that the person is facing and out of that feeling you help the beggar and when you went back home when the beggar is out of the sight he is not out of your mind you still have the continued feeling you still would be worried whether the beggar would have had the breakfast or not you would be worried whether the beggar would have had the dinner or not that is empathy without empathy one cannot be an effective social being and without that a cohesive social unit social organization cannot exist the article also highlights the concept of theory of mind which is the ability to understand others intention their belief system their knowledge and recognize that those might be different from your own and hence acceptance as part of your gs paper 4 you study many theories and researches which proves that greater social skills and emotional regulations are more important determinant for a person to be successful rather than simply possessing knowledge and information now let's see how social and emotional learning will lead to overall success in life first of all a person having good social and emotional skill will be an emotionally intelligent person the components of emotional intelligence in him or her would be very sound there would be awareness of one's own feeling and the emotions of others and empathy is one implicit part of emotional intelligence when there is awareness about one's own emotion and emotion of others and one possesses empathy then the communication become very very effective i'll give you an example suppose you're the boss and your employee is late not only late today but regularly late and as the boss obviously you'll be concerned about work culture discipline punctuality at your workplace but you see the manner and the way in which you will talk to your employee depends upon his or her state of mind as well suppose there is some serious issue back home maybe the mother is sick there's no one at home for the household chores so the person is first doing the job and then coming to the office and that is making him or her late or suppose a person is depressed or suppose a person is having a callous behavior in different situation you will have a different kind of conversation and without knowing the person's emotional and social status 
you cannot be an effective communicator. So understanding of emotion and state of mind makes a man effective communicator. That is very important in any social setup. People possessing good social and emotional skill, they're also having a general happy state of mind. When you don't let the negative emotion to take over, you are generally happy. Like Karl Barth said, joy is the simplest form of gratitude. UPSC also has asked this once as a topic of essay. This feeling, this is state of body and mind is there when you feel satisfied and contented. When negative emotion of greed, anger is not ruling the body and mind. A socially and emotionally strong person generally has positive attitude. Despite difficulties, despite hurdles, despite unfavorable conditions. You must have heard this very famous line from the movie The Dark Knight of Christopher Nolan. Why do we fall? So that we learn to pick ourselves up. This positive outlook comes from management of emotion. In the context of civil service, it's more important that the person manages the emotion and not get dissuaded by acquisitions or rumors. Many a time, some pressure group or even media can become hostile towards some civil servant or bureaucrat. In that situation, for the person to continue working with objectivity and civil service values, it's important that he manages the emotion. Gandhiji has said that nobody can hurt me without my permission. This mental strength has to be there to not allow negative emotions to start ruling the body and mind. Learning social skills and managing emotion also create endurance in adverse situation. You have to know how to keep the negative emotion and keep going. There is a very famous line from one of the songs of Sahel Ludhianavi. You might have heard. Main zindagi ka saath nibhata chala gaya. Har fikr ko dhuwe mein udata chala gaya. But if at all you use this in your exam, you must give an English translation. But this is the spirit that is required for dedication, for commitment, to maintain integrity. And that comes from social and emotional learning. Emotion helps a lot in learning. Charles Darwin has said that emotion has helped human race during the process of evolution. It helps in adaptability. Plato has said that all learning has an emotional base. If you recall the discoveries and inventions that you have known so far, you will figure out that most of them have emotional base, unless they were accidental. When the person has good social and emotional learning, the person's behavior is predictable because there is a strong control on negative emotions. And this helps in having a better relation, both personal and professional. Daniel Goldman, who worked intensively on emotional quotient, According to him, 80% of adult success depends on emotional quotient and not intelligence quotient. As a social being, you also have to influence the social environment around you in order to develop good ethical social infrastructure. So as a moral agent of Immanuel Kant, you must have persuasive power. And persuasion requires understanding of others' state of mind, their emotional state. Rashid Ogunluru has said, the only way to change someone's mind is to connect with them from their heart. Meaning emotional connect is important to change the mind, to change the thinking, to persuade someone. Hence, social and emotional learning becomes very important in a social setup. Now, as the second half of the discussion, as per the article, we shall discuss as to how social and emotional learning is dependent upon social interaction, real life experiences. So now we shall discuss the importance of social interaction of a moral agent in a social unit. See, human behavior flows out of attitude largely, although the situation also influences our behavior. Attitude has three components. One is called as cognitive component. Cognition means information, the knowledge that we possess. Whether that is biased or unbiased, right or wrong, factual or false, it does not matter. Whatever information you are holding, that is going to form cognitive component of your attitude. The information and the knowledge that we have, that will elicit some emotion in us. For instance, suppose it has been fed into your mind that Africans are drug peddlers. They are unhygienic people. They are involved in women trafficking. Because of this information, when you see an African in your vicinity, your attitude will be to maintain some distance. The information is invoking some emotion, emotion of fear emotion of disgust. That is the effective or the emotion component of your attitude. The third component of attitude is behavioral component. 
Suppose you met an African and he was such a gentleman. He or she engaged with you in a nice conversation, was very helpful, was very polite and was also very knowledgeable and qualified. The next time when you see an African, you will not be repulsive. Your past experience and encounter will affect your present behavior. The past experiences that forms the behavioral component of the attitude. All these three components are interlinked. Our past experiences and encounter, they actually affect our cognition. The knowledge base, the information set, that is updated because of the experiences and encounters that we have. And as soon as cognition is affected, emotion is bound to get affected. If your cognition changes, if your information changes, if your cognitive attitude towards African changes, then the moment you look at an African, the kind of emotion that will be unleashed in you will also change. So behavior that influences cognition, which in turn influences emotion, and that in turn affects the overall attitude. There are three terms here which are important for the exam. Stereotypes, prejudices, and discrimination. Stereotypes are our beliefs about what are the typical characteristics or traits of a member of a specific group. In terms of attitude, our stereotypes forms the cognitive component of our attitude. Prejudice is basically prejudgment, forming an opinion before you are aware of the relevant facts. Prejudice is always used in the negative connotation. It occurs when someone holds a negative feeling about a group of people. And in terms of attitude, prejudice forms the affective or the emotional component of our attitude. Discrimination is action. Discrimination in terms of attitude forms the behavioral component of our attitude. So the big question is how to mitigate the prejudice, especially when it is so pervasive and intense. The author takes the help of work of Bernard Alpert, which was done in 1954. He published The Nature of Prejudice. And in that, he gives a theory on prejudice, which popularly came to be known as the contact hypothesis. The idea was that contact, of course, with some caveat, contacts reduces prejudices. And subsequently, the sociologist arrived at a simpler idea that friendship reduces prejudices. Then to make the argument more compelling as must be done in your answers, the author cites more research work, more findings, especially one of the research work conducted by Lokniti, which is in itself a research project of Center for Studying the Developing Society. In this study, it was found out that 83% of majority community members who had a minority friend were comfortable living in non-majority neighborhood. And when the majority community members were not having a minority friend, then only 70% were comfortable in living in the non-majority community. Meaning if a majority community member has a non-minority friend, then the propensity, the willingness to live in a non-majority community increases. Overall, that reflects a positive attitude towards minorities. The author also cites a study where it was shown that people who consume media plentifully, in their case, interaction with people outside their community weakens prejudice. So the answer to the question, how to mitigate prejudice when it is so pervasive and intense, if has to be answered in one word, is this. Interactions. Friendship. Contact. All these things will basically target the behavioral component of attitude, which in turn will change the cognitive component and the emotional component. Interactions do change attitude. To give you an example, few decades back or to certain extent even today, many Westerners see Indians as people of tribal culture, snake charmers, elephant riders. They have negative attitude towards Indians. When Swami Vivekananda went to Chicago to address world's first religion congress in 1893, just by looking at his attire, people started to walk off. And then Swami Vivekananda began his speech by saying, My brothers and sisters of America. That instantly changed the attitude. When you experience the interaction with the man, you saw brotherhood in his approach. That changed the behavioral component of attitude. And that must have also induced positive emotion, affecting the affective component of attitude. After the speech, 
the information that they must be carrying about Indians must also have changed, affecting the cognitive component of attitude. The point to understand here is, behavioral component affect both emotional component and cognitive component of attitude. That is why interaction is so very important. However, the author also says that close interaction will have minimal effect if the attitude of suspicion and negativity towards minorities are deeply entrenched in the society. Also, if the interaction is such that members from majority community have member from minority community as friends, but they consider their friend to be exception to the rule, meaning that their friend is good, but the entire minority community is not good. Then in these cases, even the close interaction will not cross the threshold to bring social cohesion. If you look from this model, if the cognitive component of attitude is extremely strong, meaning you are jaundiced with suspicion, then even few positive interaction will not affect the overall attitude. The author further says that if there is ghettoization of minorities, then naturally that will reduce the social interactions. So behavioral component will have very few opportunity to be changed. So if we ask this question yet again, how to mitigate prejudice, the answer will not change very much. Towards the end, the author cites work of Asutosh Vashne. He explains in his book, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, that peace and social cohesion between different communities and society is possible only if there is civic engagement. And there's a crucial thing here. There is a redefining of us. Discrimination resulting from prejudice begins in cognition. When you think that there is us and them, when you are carrying this notion, then cognitive component of attitude becomes extremely intense and negative. To change this will require education, will require leadership, and will require building a social ecosystem that will be tolerant and inclusive. We can just graze through this concept so that you can use it in the section of social justice in GS Paper 2, GS Paper 4 and your essays. It is a still an evolving concept and we will not get into the detailed psychological study that is involved in subjective well-being research work. As the name suggests, subjective well-being is the measure of well-being. But it is the measure by people's own evaluation of their life. Generally, it is done by giving out some questionnaire. So the measurement is from the answers given by people themselves. And there is no objective measurement of material conditions like the status of health and education, the income level. But you understand there is always correlation between different aspects of a person's life. Although these are not measured, but the subjective evaluation of one's life will depend on these things. So subjective well-being evaluates person's own life, including their emotional experience and their cognitive evaluation of what a person considers a good life. So rather than a mathematical statistical exercise, it is the measurement of experience of people. And since it is measurement of experience of people, it is also taken as the basic measurement of happiness sometime. So there are two things, people's emotional reactions to their surroundings, to the events, and their cognitive judgment of satisfaction. So there is an emotional component to subjective well-being and cognitive component, just like you have in attitude. So subjective well-being is going to capture moods, feelings, emotions of people and their evaluation of their own satisfaction. Although subjective well-being is considered to be relatively stable, but it can change to a great degree depending upon situation. For example, during COVID-19 pandemic, the subjective well-being lowered substantially as per leading surveys. As discussed already, there are two components of subjective well-being. One is effective component. Effective refers to mood, feeling or emotions. And the other is cognitive component. Cognition is the information, the knowledge that one possesses. The cognitive component is also referred to as life satisfaction. That life satisfaction can also be domain specific. For example, the work related satisfaction or relationship related satisfaction. That depends purely on information that you possess of your position in your workplace or the warmness in the relationship. Now, if we can relate this to the previous discussion that we had on social and emotional learning, the ability to control emotion is extremely important. It has a lot to do with subjective well-being. There are many things that you can think of that will affect subjective well-being. 
Psychologists have pointed out to several things. One of the most important factor in subjective well-being is the personality trait. Personality trait will include the ability to balance the emotion, the emotional intelligence of a person, the positive outlook, the ability for endurance, ability to manage the negative emotions like greed and anger. Other personality traits like relationship enhancing traits, people who easily give affiliations, people with tolerance, they are also very important for subjective well-being. And we also have discussed before that people having higher social and emotional learning, they are effective communicator. Effective communication is important for happy state of mind. If you are not able to communicate your emotional state, you will feel dissatisfied. Many people channelize their emotion through their literary work because that gives satisfaction. Social well-being also depends upon the social influence that prevails in society. There is a famous Framingham Heart study. One of the result of the study says that friends three degree of separation away, that means friend of friend of friend, can affect a person's happiness. The concept of plateau that we talked about, we should live in a society like different cells of organism, where parts benefit the whole and the whole benefits the part. With feeling of fraternity, cohesiveness, that influences social well-being. The family as an institution that has a great role in developing personality traits and has powerful social influence on individuals is an important factor. In societies where individualistic tendency is high, reporting of social well-being is higher with relative degree of wellness. Wealth, of course, is a factor that determines one's experience of one's life. Cultural variations is also an important factor. You might have heard that people of certain places are very satisfied with limited resources. For example, if you go to the mountainous region, people do not live very lavish city well life. But being close to the nature, being in a better clean environment, even with limited resources, they live a happy life. A lot depends as to what is our notion of a good life prevailing in our society. That affects both the effective and the cognitive component of social well-being. There is an article on page number 7, Holding Transnational Corporations Accountable. This article is based in one report of UN which is not very pertinent to civil service examination. But this article does discuss bilateral investment treaties and this is important for the exam. However, this already has been covered in the previous DNS. In case you have missed the discussion on this, I have given the reference link in the description section. Now you have on your screen question for the day for today. You also have the answer to yesterday's question of the day. Please attempt the question, put out your answer in the comment section. Also try to attempt the DNS quiz on the eLearn platform. Goodbye. Take care.